Chris Power, welcome to the show. Uh, Jordy's slacking off. He's he's taking a break. He'll be back in a couple minutes, but good to have you. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be in the capital of the capital. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's good to have you here. Uh, how has life been? You've been traveling. Uh, you were spotted on a flight to Washington, D.C. a couple a couple weeks ago. The paparazzi caught you. Um, yeah, that was crazy. That, yeah, that was crazy. I, I didn't realize that there were so, so many uh, spies out there in Silicon Valley. But uh, how was your trip to D.C.? It was incredible. Obviously, can't talk about most of it. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it's classified. Very impactful, especially with the new administration coming in, wants mm -hmm. to fix American manufacturing and, you know, the vice president gave an incredibly rousing speech about reindustrialization at the end recent conference. So it was incredible. And yeah, look, I, I don't know who leaked that photo to you. I was a bit concerned whether it was a fan or like a communist spy tracking down all the yeah. defense tech founders. But, you know, you got to be careful these yeah. days. Yeah, yeah, you got to be careful. Uh, m maybe wear like a full beard and glasses next time. Full disguise. I just, I just got to go out and say I think you have the coolest office of anybody that's been on the show so far. It's, it's a fantastic uh, office. What, what of you? Unless it's a green screen. It's and not. That, I've been no, there. No, it's real. <laughs> it's not a green screen. Real factory. And a lot of a lot of machines working constantly. How are the lights today? I know that on the top of each one of those machines, there's a light. It can turn red. It can turn green. How are we looking today? Very, very green, fellas. Very green. Yeah. That's great. Just like, just like the ramp logo. Everything's going on. Fantastic. That's great to hear. Uh, we well, anyway, you, you didn't even get a chance to uh, introduce yourself. Can you just give us like the high level pitch for Hadrian, what you're building and where it's going? Yeah. So I'm Chris Power. Uh, Hadrian builds autonomous factories. Um, so, you know, we deindustrialized the country from the 70s through the 90s and gave all our industrial power to China. And now the incredibly skilled workforce that does incredible technical things in high precision machining or castings are all aging out. So we really don't have an industrial base anymore. So our, our mission is to reindustrialize the US by building highly automated factories that are, uh, you know, as efficient as China with a lot more software robotics and a new manufacturing workforce. Can, I see that the uh, lights can... are on in that factory. We're trying to get to lights out factories. Is that the goal? Is that is that just Chinese propaganda when I hear them? Talking no, we're, about we're 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 lights out today. We run twenty four seven with oh, a handful yeah. of really smart people running the fleet. Uh, the lights are on now because we're all here. Yeah, yeah we're we're a twenty four seven seven day a week operation. Wow, that's awesome. Can the robots save us? Right, <laughs> uh, it's a very scary time right now where yeah. China's producing a lot of robots that uh, have. Uh, can be used for a lot of things, you know, flying, you know, maybe a, over your kid's birthday party to get fun footage, or they can, you know, be kamikaze. used uh, in kamikaze ways. But uh, it feels like automation and advanced robotics-led manufacturing is the only way that, like y you said it yourself, maybe the only way that we really reindustrialize. We just don't have the sort of skilled labor force, but um, you're you're betting the the company on that. Uh, but uh, but I, uh, maybe kind of talk a little bit more about that specifically. Yeah, I mean, our, our goal with our software and robotics is to make it so easy to be highly skilled that anyone can do it. Mm -hmm. um, and 100% of our workforce are people who've never set foot inside a factory before. They're just 10 times more productive uh, because we're getting them superpowers with software and robotics, right? Mm -hmm. And I would, you know, you guys are big fans of Formula One. So like a lot of what our software does is, you know, imagine if your uh, son or daughter who was learning to drive, they had Tesla autopilot on an F1 car, they can just, you know, mm -hmm. drive a McLaren very quickly without much training. That's kind of what our software does. And we really believe in using the best of software and robotics to give the new workforce 10 times more efficiency with superpowers, you know, versus like replacing them entirely, you know. Yeah, and so is this the same way? Like uh, to compare it to yesterday, anybody can can do uh, Ghibli Studio Ghibli animation. So like anybody should be able to make like the, you know the the most you know advanced aerospace you know parts, etc. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, uh, is is do you think we can get to the like what was impactful yesterday is that over the past maybe a couple of years, if you were really really good at prompt engineering, you could. Uh, you could kind of create some outputs like we were seeing yesterday, but the average person would go into these models and they wouldn't have any success, right? They tried a couple of yeah. times and be like, this is slop. Are we still at the point today on the sort of manufacturing side and what you're doing where it's like, you need to be like actually like very, very good, but you're sort of aiming to get to that point where somebody can come in and just sort of like make, make a part and, and one shot it. I think 80% of our processes were at that point where we're in Ghibli mode, one shot. Uh, there's some really deep digital manufacturing stuff that you still need an expert to do. So we're in the like 
software engineer is 10 times more productive land versus anyone can code. But I would say 80% of our factory is like anyone can code today. Are, are there a, the, the specific programming language is like cam programming, right? Isn't that it? Yeah. Um, is there, is there like a, are there LLMs that are good at that type of coding language? Like there's no cursor for cam that you're like on top of and just plugging in to speed things up. No, so we, we had to build that full stack ourselves. Okay. Um, and the main reason is all of those digital manufacturing tools, which are super hard to use and you need to be an expert, mm -hmm. generate basically terrible assembly code that the machines run on. Yep. Um, but because American manufacturing is largely regulated in ITAR, there is no training data on it's the internet. On the web. Yep. So uh, the, one of the reasons why our internal models actually work for manufacturing, you know, machine learning models is because we're the only ones with a labeled data set because we're creating it daily in the factory. Yep. There is no stack overflow for manufacturing data. Mm -hmm. So none of the off the shelf models actually have ever been trained on any of this. Interesting. Uh, I imagine that every hard tech, defense tech, frontier tech founder eventually has to come through and kiss the ring. Uh, at, at your uh, at, at your factory, just because it's like, hey, you know, they're basically like, hey, we're gonna make we're gonna make prototypes, and then we're gonna go sell contracts, and then we're gonna eventually need to deliver on those, and like somebody's got to make the parts. Uh, how many how many companies right now do you, do you have that are like they're going out there promising these big things, and then you know at the end of the day they're gonna come back to you and be like, okay, now the, we need to make this. The is king that, thing is, is so funny because like, I, I imagine still... you 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 work with some of the, like you know, some of these sort of more established companies, but then I'm sure like. I'm sure there's like a hundred plus, you know, pretty exciting yeah. companies that are basically like in almost like in your pipeline where they're like, we're going to work with you. We just need to like prove that we can. Someone's got to make the parts for the F-47. Yeah. And, and you know, someone's going to make the whole products as well. So, uh, you know, I would say that for a large established customers, like, you know, we're making a lot of stuff for them. For a lot of the newer entrants or for new programs, we are becoming a like co-prime where mm. the DOD Hey, hey, John, uh, you can definitely make 50 drones or 50 of this product, but we'd really love you to partner with Hadrian because we think they should build your Tesla Gigafactory for this product line. Mm -hmm. There's really this partnerships model of helping them prototype and then scale rapidly. Uh, but yeah, we're like, you know, we can only build so many factories a year. So the waiting list of uh, everyone wants a Hadrian factory to uh, deploy their products at scale in the U.S. is uh, growing quite a lot, which we're very lucky about. What do you, what do you think about uh, the classic Harvard MBA who's like I'm gonna go buy this sort of SMB manufacturing shop that's you know putting up five million dollars of EBITDA and they've done so for thirty years so they're just gonna are they like buying like sort of an aging asset or or is it worth is there sort of like value in sort of like understanding what they're doing and sort of like, upskilling it or the machine adding, shop roll up yeah, yeah, idea the machine shop roll ups of, of the world. I think in general it's a terrible idea, and the main reason is is like you want to run a factory, you gotta you gotta be leading the people, and you gotta have that credibility. And no master machinist or welder is gonna respect a kid who's got a suit and a Harvard MBA on coming and telling him what to do. Um, I think yeah. it's a really tough gig. Um, is it also, also one of those the, things where you want to? Chris actually you wanna, tried to do this like years yeah. and years ago. Yeah, like, but it, but yeah. is it also before it was a trend? <laughs> no, I imagine there's been so many advancements and everything from robotics to. AI that you would want to just think about the factory, like how would you build a factory today versus mm. sort of buying this asset that's been operational yeah, for decades? Scratch. Because we're having um, Druva on from Deterrence later, and he's got all these crazy stories where we're walking around these factory floors and there's an active machine being used that's from the 40s, like the <laughs> yep. 1940s. Like it was working in World War II and we're still using keep, it today. Keep using it. And so I imagine if you have the opportunity to partner with a new defense tech company and say, well, like here's what's available now. Like you don't have to go yeah. and try to take over some old factory. Yeah, and a, a lot of the capital equipment in all of the naval facilities or, you know, everywhere in machine shops is, you know, somewhere between from the 1950s to the 1980s. And it's just yeah. impossible to automate it because often none of them have computers on them in the first place. So you really got to really build these factories from scratch with new technology and new workforce. How do you think about uh, when you're setting up one of these new factories, and and for companies that are in defense at all uh are are there the the actual machines themselves that then sit on the factory floor i imagine a lot of the best ones are built and designed and manufactured you know everything like in china so how do you, how do you think about sort of the supply chain for the autonomous factories that you guys are building and sort of you know, it's a, figuring it's out a very to... hard question that the country's got to answer. So the machinery market, so we invented in Air Force invented CNC machine. 
Um, and we no longer make CNC machines in the US. And I think you saw this article about, you know, Haas white labeling some China ones and selling to the Russians. Um, yeah. But the main the main manufacturing markets where we buy from is China's number one. We don't buy for them because they got spyware all over this stuff. And then it's, you know, Germany, South Korea, Japan are the best machine makers. And it's kind of like the car market. You know, you can buy an Italian one and it behaves like an Alfa Romeo and it's really fast, <laughs> but it's going to it's you're going to be in maintenance hell forever. And the German ones are really stable and the, you know, the Korean ones are quite good. So, you know, if the balloon goes up with the conflict. Uh, you know, can we even buy the amount of capital equipment to put in the factories because we don't produce that capital equipment in the US anymore. So, you know, part of my job is grow super fast and buy all the CapEx from our from our allied partners and make sure it's in the US. But uh, yeah, we, we no longer make the underlying machines in the country anymore. Can you, talk, uh, can you talk a little bit about the continuing resolution? Um, you're not a company that's going directly for program of record, but obviously your fate is kind of tied to that. I mean, I, yeah, I know that you probably can, but um, uh, can you talk about like, how did you interpret the news? There's been a lot of chatter about this is a bear case for the entire industry. Maybe there's uh, green shoots of opportunity. How are you processing it? What's your strategy? So we're in a really luck lucky position where we're everyone's factory. So mm -hmm. as long as we have enough customers who are winning and losing, like, we, we're growing at a rapid clip rate because mm -hmm. we're kind of the index of the market, right? Sure. Which is a really lucky position to be. In. Yeah. Um, we also partner with a select few companies, again, to co-bid on these major programs that manufacturing is a real challenge. But for our core business, you know, if you're a small defense startup that they've got one big program of record and that gets delayed nine months, your burn rate's through the roof. You're mm -hmm. canceling your ramp credit card. You know, <laughs> you can't put ads on AdQuick anymore. You're yeah. in a really tough position. <laughs> yeah. No aid sleep? Brutal. No, 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 sleep. no, I mean, if you've paid for you know, it, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. sleep's not leaving you. Yeah, but for, yeah. for larger for larger companies like Andrew, you know, they're working on 10 programs at once. Sure. So if a couple of them get delayed, it's not a huge issue. I think yep, Delian's yep, yep. absolutely right about like if you're a startup and you're bidding on one and that revenue cycle blows out nine months, you're in real trouble. Sure, for sure. platform companies like ours where we're growing with many customers and sure, some of them get delayed, like it doesn't really affect us that much. Um, and we're in a really good position where we can eat those long continuing resolution cycles because our core business is growing like 10 times, you know, 10 X year on year. Um, so it doesn't affect us as much. It's kind of like, you know, do you guys really care whether people watch movies on Netflix or Hulu? Cause everyone's using AWS. We mm -hmm. certainly don't. Yeah. Uh, and we try not to have favorites, you know, yeah, uh, we, yeah. we'd love to manufacture everything for everybody. What, it, uh, what, what does success look like? Uh, just purely from a, you know, the, the thing that comes to mind is like, there was this meme that like, 30% of venture dollars go to go to meta, right? I, I don't think it was quite yeah. true, but is the future of Hadrian is like 30% of hard tech dollars just <laughs> go straight to Hadrian is like, is like, obviously, like, if you're just if your job is to produce products, yeah. like, and you need a factory to do that, like a huge parts. part of the cog should be the factory. And then, yeah, uh, I, I think the most successful companies that are continuing to raise huge growth rounds are building faster and better with Hadrian. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, uh, yeah, I think 70% of all the deep tech dollars goes to, you know, there's some headcount for engineering, but a lot of it is producing prototypes and then scaling factories and components. So yeah, we, we believe that we will are quickly becoming the index of the market and, you know, everyone needs a gigafactory, right? That's right. Uh, what's going on? Uh, what's your thoughts on Europe broadly? We've covered the automotive market quite a lot on the show, just, you know, Germany's kind of thrown in the towel, some manufacturer, you know, sending their manufacturers, you know, it was even Porsche's setting up US manufacturing. I think it's a bit of a shame. Do they, is there a world in which Hadrian, you know, helps kind of revitalize some of these, you know, the German in in industrial economy, just because maybe they, 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 they have this great industrial base, but then uh, haven't maybe focused as much on, on sort of core innovation around the factory. Yeah, so we have so much work to do here in the U.S. that we'd love we'd love to support our allied partners in Europe and the you know the Middle East and countries like Japan reindustrialize as well, and they often have the same kind of core skilled labor problem. But we've got so much to work to do here: fixing the navy, fixing munitions production, helping our customers scale. But I think we'll get there in a year or two. I think really what you're seeing in Europe is two warring tribes. One is the people that are you know, set their energy policy based off the poor advice of a 14 year old Swedish girl and gave all the leverage to Russian oil and gas. 
Uh, and then you've got your kind of Richard the Lionhearts, you know, it's like we need to reindustrialize Europe. Let's go make our own fighter jets and drones and naval fleets. So, uh, I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's good that the English are waking up, in my opinion. We need, we need everyone in the fight. Fantastic. Well, that's a great place to wrap up. Thanks so much for coming on the show. We'll have to have it you back took, soon. It took way too long to get you on yeah, the I know, show. I know. I we, we messed you up. But this is the perfect you're busy. day. You're it was busy. a great day for this. And you've been it's busy. a perfect day. I'm happy to, uh, happy to be in the capital of the capital anytime. And uh, you know, you. God bless the United States of America and uh, you know the financial system of the U.S. economy. Thank you, it's gentlemen. It's just Thank fantastic. You. Thanks for coming on. Great to see you. Bye.